Well, 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 looky here. It's Fish Fry. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 515 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. What have I got cooked up for you this week? Well, my friends, this week's podcast is two parts open source, one part FT8 and one part ham radio. My guest is Colby Gilbert from Radio Stack, and we're digging into the details of Maverick 603, the first affordable FT8 receiver with an open source RF chip designed and fabricated using only open source chip tools. And a little later on, I investigate a new crash avoidance sensor inspired by insects. <laughs> so first, please welcome Colby from Radio Stack. Hi, Colby. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so we're talking about the Maverick 603, the first affordable FT8 receiver with an RF chip designed using open source chip tools and fabrication. But Colby, before we dig into the details about Maverick, tell me a little bit about yourself and your company, Radio Stack. Yeah, definitely. So I graduated WPI last May, and one of my mentors throughout college was Jeremy Hitchcock. And I kind of didn't want to stay in the basic engineering fields, uh, kind of rank up through that and stay a little too technical. I kind of was talking to Jeremy about some projects that had to do with some comms and GPS on aircraft and everything. And we started talking about chips a little bit and how they're controlled by kind of a few manufacturers, TSMC, a uh, few of the big ones, Global Foundries, and then you have the software side of things, which is really just a couple companies in the world that produce a software. And we wanted to see if it would be possible to make a commercial version with just open source tools, because the commercial tools, Cadence, Synopsys, tools like those cost a lot, a lot of money. And sometimes companies really, the barrier to entry for them is really, really high and expensive. So we started there and we started talking to eFablist, who's the company that's kind of the go between the chip designs and the actual foundry. So they'll take your designs in, they'll send them to the foundry and get them made for you. And so at that point, we pretty much knew we were going to make a chip. And then it kind of came to the idea of, so what's the plan going to be for what are we going to make it do? Basically, what's the function of it? And we both kind of we're working a little bit with ham radio stuff because it's a interesting hobby. It's a huge hobby worldwide, millions and millions of people. But we ended up deciding that FT8 was the best way to go. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit more later. But yeah, that's kind of how everything started and we got the ball rolling. So that was the motivation to create Maverick 603, right? It came from the ham radio space? Yeah, it was a little bit of both. I think of it as like a two prong, like half in the ham radio side and half in the uh, chip side of things. For the chip side, we just wanted to show that it was possible. And we talked to Fabulous kind of a lot about that, about being an example to some of these other projects and people. There's a reason you don't see semiconductor companies coming out of dorm rooms like you do, you know, Dell and those companies like that. Absolutely. So just in case my audience needs a bit of a refresher, let's talk a little bit about FT8. What is this kind of radio protocol good for? So FT8s, right now, it's one of the most popular digital modes for ham radio. The best way to compare it, I like to compare it to texting, basically, without getting into all the timing and everything. It's basically like texting someone. It's restricted to 13 characters, essentially, and you send messages back and forth to people all over the world. And the good thing about FT8 is that your computer can hear it at very, very low volumes compared to other modes. So you can send a signal with not as much power and you can receive it with less equipment than you normally would need. And there's some things that have tiny antennas that are receiving signals from Russia and China and Asia all over the world, which is why we picked it. And it's probably at all the modes easiest to learn because especially if you're just receiving, because you just look at it, usually it's just two call signs, the sender, the receiver, and you can kind of see where you're getting it from. How does it work? And that's our other motivation too, is to bring more people into ham radio because to receive, you don't need a license. 
And FTA is probably the, the least scary out of all the modes. I love that. So I was especially interested in that the RF receiver chip included in the Maverick 603 was designed using fully open source tools and fabrication. So tell my audience about the open source aspect of this design and why you chose open source. Yeah. So for the open source chips, we really wanted to show that this was possible to make a commercially viable product. And the tools we use were all open source and you meet with the developers sometimes. So open source tools for making a chip, it consists of a handful of tools. And in the larger companies, all those tools are combined into one program. But for open source tools, they're all separated. Each step of the process, schematics, layout, everything like that is separated. And you look at the tools and I've met with the developers and sometimes it's just one person who developed the tool for you, which is really cool to see. And you talk directly to them about problems and they'll kind of walk you through it. Great support systems. But the open source tools aspect makes it a little difficult for the chip, just all the steps and transporting it and everything like that. So the open source side of things, we chose to do that, obviously, to show it was possible and to show, like, kind of get it out there so people can do it. Because you see a lot of Project 3 fabulous that come from schools or different educational places that have trouble affording tools like Cadence or Synopsis. So this makes it available to them. Absolutely. Now, what kind of specs are we looking at when it comes to the Maverick 603? Uh, So for the Maverick, it's a receiver of FT8. And the cool thing about the Maverick is that for most of ham radio SDRs that aim at kind of digital modes and things like that, they don't hit as low frequency as us. They kind of tend to hang around except for obviously the more up higher scale, more expensive ones. They hang around maybe 30 megahertz, but we go down to seven megahertz so we can hit some of the most popular FT8 bands, which you'll see a ton of traffic on. And so our, our range is seven to 70 megahertz. And then we're gonna have microprocessor on there, on the board, which the board's all open source as well. So that's another cool thing about the design. And it basically is just a simple receiver design, start to finish, as you normally would see, And we're going to be able to receive at some noise levels that are really, really low to get FT8 and everything. And even if you don't have the right equipment, you'll still be able to get it because FT8 is low volume. And we're going to have the USB output and kind of everything to make it as close to a normal SDR, but also as turnkey as we can make it just so that it's pretty easy to use. So you guys have launched a crowd supply crowdfunding campaign for the Maverick 603. So give me some details on this. So for the crowd supply thing, it was at the very beginning, we, we had an open source product and it seemed like every other open source product, like the way to go was to do a crowdfunding thing. And we looked around a little bit and crowd supply seemed perfect to us because they really focus on hardware and they focus on SDR devices, which was really cool to us. But it was a little difficult because we were the pretty much the first company to make an open source chip ever and the first to make it on a crowdfunding site. It was kind of a touch and go from both sides, figuring out kind of how it would work, what it would look like, because no one really knew how we would market this or anything like that. So it was a good effort between us and CrowdSupply and eFabless. And obviously, one of the main goals of CrowdSupply is to help companies and projects that are very technically focused kind of with the marketing and the outreach and everything like that, which was probably the biggest help CrowdSupply had for us because they were able to walk us through how we could get this out there. But the ham radio people, it's not too difficult. They're really passionate about this stuff. So the ham radio people helped us a lot kind of get this out there too. But CrowdSupply also does the fulfillment and shipping and everything, which I mean, for us is huge because the manpower and kind of the logistics to do that stuff would have been really, really hard for us. But CrowdSupply was really good. Josh Lifton, their CEO, is awesome at explaining kind of how it works and everything and how you price things. Because in college, you know, I took mostly engineering course, almost all engineering. So it's a little bit difficult to kind of make that switch so fast into the business and marketing side of things. So they were a huge help with that side. Absolutely. I wouldn't imagine you'd know any about that just with regular engineering courses. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and um, crowd supplies, their reach was probably the final kind of selling point for us. They just have the biggest reach out of at, at least open source hardware, probably all of open source products. So just getting it out there and they work with microchip and they work with RF accelerators and they are able to push these projects 
past the finish line really, really soon. You see mostly funded projects on their site. And for us, it was just, how can we get this to the most amount of people as quick as we can? And Craftsfly seemed like the obvious choice. This is super cool, Colby. I wish you all the luck in the world. But before you go, it's a little off the cuff question. Now, you mentioned you liked hockey. You've played it in school and in college. So you're going to continue to play hockey? Is it is it something you can do for the rest of your life? Or are you hanging up your, your skates? Uh, I plan to do it for the rest of my life. It's a bit tough scheduling now to get in, on the ice as much as I used to, but it's not too hard to find places to skate up in New Hampshire. So we'll find a, a men's league here and there and get on the ice a couple of times a month. Excellent. All right. Well, Colby, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. This was super cool. Thank you. Thank you for having me. If you want even more information about Radio Stack and Maverick 603, I would strongly encourage you to check out my fellow editor at EE Journal, Max Maxfield's feature article entitled, Developing the World's First Commercially Available RF Device with an Open Source Chip. And you can read this article by clicking the link below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com, by clicking the link in the YouTube description, or by heading on over to the article section of eejournal.com. Let's talk about avoiding car collisions. I don't know about you, but I've been in quite a few in my lifetime. Only a couple of them were my fault. And if I wasn't in another one, that would be fantastic. But did you know that even though only 25% of our average travel by car happens at night, almost half of fatal accidents occur at night? It's true. So what if we could do something about that? And what if the answer to obstacle avoidance isn't in software? It's in an insect instead. Okay, so backing up a second here, there are a variety of different kinds of collision avoidance systems or CASs on the market today. Some automatically break when something gets too close to the vehicle. Other options analyze the image of the space around the car, but also need complicated signal processing to understand that image when conditions are a little less than great. There is also radar and LIDAR as well, but those systems also add weight, a slew of energy requirements, and can be difficult to miniaturize. So get this, a team of researchers from Pennsylvania State University have developed a new kind of collision avoidance sensor that uses tens of thousands times less energy than conventional collision avoidance sensors, all by studying the brains of insects. Okay, so the key here is how insects avoid collisions. They use what is called obstacle avoiding neural circuits. So first, this team from Pennsylvania State University used those neural circuits to create a specialized algorithm. But instead of processing the whole image, this team only processed one part, the intensity of the car's headlights. So in their design, there is no need for an image sensor or onboard camera, and the processing units and detection units are combined. So this solution is much smaller and much more energy efficient than other solutions on the market today. So the sensor. This sensor is made up of eight photosensitive MEM transistors constructed from a layer of molybdenum, which has been organized onto a circuit. The entire sensor measures only 40 square micrometers and uses only a few hundred picojoules of energy. And the super cool part of this new sensor is its use at night. This detector can sense a potential two-car accident two to three seconds before it happens, giving drivers enough time to take critical corrective action. 
Let me be clear though. The researchers on this project do not believe that this solution will replace other collision avoidance systems. They say, we strongly believe that the proposed collision detectors can augment existing sensors necessary for ensuring autonomous vehicular safety. Wow, sign me up. So if you want even more information about this automotive collision avoidance sensor inspired by insect brains, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com, including the associated research paper called Insect-Inspired Spike-Based Insensor and Nighttime Collision Detector based on atomically thin and light-sensitive MEM transistors. <laughs> hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you'd like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I absolutely understand. <laughs> you can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we do have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or, heck, you just want to chat, Shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com. Or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of January 20th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.